Good afternoon, everyone. This is Caradina Sale with the Mixover Institute and the Community Technical Assistance Center. We were, are going to start in about one minute. We still see a lot of people who are logging in. So just give us one minute and we'll begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Caradina Sale with the Mixover Institute, along with the Community Technical Assistance Center and Managed Care Technical Assistance Center. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, What's Food Got to Do With It? Food Insecurity and Mental Health. The Mixover Institute, CTAC and MCTAC, have partnered to launch this multi-platform online series intended to help clinical professionals, community health workers, educators, policymakers, and any and all who influence our healthcare system to think critically about those social factors that have a direct and indirect impact on an individual's health and mental health. Throughout the series of social determinants of health, we are bringing into focus the linkage between poverty, racial disparities, and health inequities, and discuss ways in which these issues can be addressed to improve health outcomes for all. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to orient everyone to the WebEx system so you know how to participate in today's event. Um, you are all on mute to avoid any background noises that may distract others from listening to the presentation today. If you come across any technical issues during today's event, please chat to the host, Brianna, who will be able to assist you. You will have the opportunity to ask questions throughout the webinar. You can just chat those in the chat box. There are also going to be opportunities for you to chat in some answers. We have some areas uh, during the webinar where we're going to ask some questions that you can chat into the chat box as well. It's located on the right-hand side of your screen. If it's not visible, click the dialog bubble on the top right toolbar and it should appear. It says chat with a little bubble. In order to ensure that we are able to answer as many questions as time permits, um, we are requesting that you send in your questions and we will have a brief Q&A at the end if time allows. Myself and my colleague, Diana Arias, are very excited to present to you today on this really important topic. Again, my name is Caradina Sale. I just want to introduce myself for those of you that don't know me. I'm a social worker here at the Mixover Institute and CTAC and MCTAC. I have been a social worker for about 20 years, working primarily with children and families. I started my work in a residential treatment center where I, I say that I had a crash course in trauma and self-care. Um, and since then, I've done a variety of work, including working in outpatient mental health clinics and working in a social intervention group around research and other kinds of work with Dr. Mary McKay, including uh, research as well as clinical work. So I'm really excited to be here today. I'm going to let Diana introduce herself, and then we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kara. Um, yes, my name is Diana. I am a social worker here also at McSilver. Um, prior to being here at McSilver about two, three years ago, I was working with adults living with HIV AIDS, and also um, at that time in access one mental health diagnosis. And prior to that, I also received uh, my master's in psychology focusing on uh, research around social injustice. Great. Thanks, Diana. I also wanted to mention that we do have CEs available for today's webinar. This is, uh, these are the instructions and how to obtain them. So you would go to this link and you would log into to Continuing Education Online Portal for the NYU Silver School of Social Work page and click on All Events and Programs tab. You'd scroll down and select today's webinar under Online Learning and Register and then you'd fill in the billing information. I believe it will cost $15 for the CEs for today. So the, it is available upon your request. I just want to go over our agenda today. So we're really looking at this relationship between food insecurity and mental health. We're going to talk about the definitions of food insecurity and hunger and the differences and the, and, and the connection between the two, obviously. We're going to talk about prevalence, 
what, what are the kind of statistics around hunger in the United States and food insecurity. And we're going to think about the impact. So how are our clients, how are people that we're working with, how are they impacted by food insecurity and the hunger? And then we're going to talk about interventions and possible solutions, ending with um, Diana's going to take us through some work that we've done here at the Institute called Family and Food Matters. I just want to start with this quote today, um, just to ground us in the context. So to many people, hunger means not just symptoms that can be diagnosed by a physician, it bespeaks the existence of a social, not a medical problem. So that this issue around hunger and food insecurity is really a social and even health issue, but more so a social and injustice issue um, that we know is, is problematic and pervasive through, all, through the work that we do. Food security. So this uh, is a definition by the World Health Organization. This is when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious, and I even want to say affordable food to maintain a healthy and active life. So this is a new term. You know, this has only been born since 1974 at the World Food Conference, where this was first brought to the platform, um, where it was originally understood at a national and state level where there's not enough uh, sufficient food to sustain a steady expansion of food consumption quote unquote, um, and then in 1996 that uh, this definition expanded to thinking about attending to the nutritious and, uh, and necessary food that people need to live. And so these, that isn't that long ago, right? 1974 is when it first came on to the platform and then 1996 at the World Food Summit. So just want to give that context as well, that we are hearing more and more about hunger and food insecurity and this is particularly why. And then food insecurity is the limited or uncertain availability of those nutritionally inadequate and safe foods or the uncertain ability, so not knowing where your next meal is going to come from. And really what we're talking about is this hidden crisis that we have on our hands um, around hunger and food insecurity, that we don't really know who is suffering and not able to put enough food on their table. So hunger has been defined as the discomfort, you know, your stomach growls, you're, you're weak or you haven't had enough food. Um, and food insecurity is really the chronicity of that hunger. And all the, the United States is called the land of the plenty, right? So we have enough food to feed everyone. I'm going to show you a little bit, uh, a slide on food production. Um, but the issue is around access and availability. So almost one in seven households, over 17 million, suffer from food insecurity or a condition that includes hunger having to skip meals, having to compromise on nutrition, and relying on emergency food sources such as food banks, food pantries, and soup kitchens. I just want to talk about the history of food insecurity. So this really started back in the Great Depression, uh, you know, when there was really a, a big economic issue where people couldn't afford to buy food. And there was so much food that went to waste because people couldn't buy it. Um, and in fact, farms were just lit on fire. Animals who were going to be slaughtered were killed. Uh, it was very sad. And, and this really became this sort of epidemic in an area where the federal government stepped in around really um, providing assistance. And so we had food stamp and other programs that came to life at that time. Um, and then and then it subsided, but it really became an issue. You'll see this is a, an image of, of Robert Kennedy, and he went on a tour. He went on what he called a poverty tour in the 60s. And this is him in the Mississippi Delta um, where he was with kids who had swollen bellies from hunger, and many of them couldn't go to school because they didn't have any clothes or shoes. And this really brought to light this issue around hunger in the 60s. And there was a documentary that was uh, created called Hunger in America that really showed this issue uh, to the public and, and where a response was generated almost immediately. And so in the 60s, um, federal assistance uh, kicked up even more. And in the 70s, hunger was almost alleviated. And so hunger was not this big of an issue in our country until really this economic downturn in, uh, 2000, in 2008. And so then it has since then, because of unemployment rose and other issues, it became a bigger issue once again. So this issue around uh, the, the policy makers have expanded their attention from this narrow focus on hunger to a broader lens. Um, for a household to be considered food secure, its members must be able to acquire this food without resorting to emergency food programs, scavenging, stealing, or 
or other coping strategies so that now we have a real lens to look at this issue. The USDA thinks about food insecurity in this way, and so I thought it'd be helpful to just look at really briefly. Um, so what it means to be food insecure. There's a, what we call low food insecurity. So households have, uh, they do have food insecurity, but not necessarily without hunger, but they are concerned about where their meals are coming from. There's a moody, medium food insecurity, where households are food insecure, where adults are going hungry, which means they are skipping meals because there's not enough, enough food in, uh, to provide for everyone. And then there's severe food insecurity, where we have households who are food insecure, where both the adults and the children are skipping meals. And if we think about food security and, and what we really want to uh, focus on in regards to the four main components and where we can think about really resolving this issue. So there's availability, making sure that there is food available. There's access. So again, a lot of our issues are around this number two access so that people have access to that food. Stability, making sure that um, the food is stable and that it's, it's healthy to eat and that um, people are able to prepare it in a way uh, to eat to the best of their their bodily functions and, and ways for them to um, nutritionally absorb it. And that's what utilization means. This is what I was mentioning earlier. So this is what uh, food production looks like per capita. And this is an increase from 1961 to 2005. Really, the, my point here is that we have enough food. We, we have a lot of evidence that shows to us that we have enough food to feed every single person in this country. And so the fact that millions of people aren't getting the adequate food and nutrition that they need and deserve is, is where, the, where we have to think critically about this issue. It is a global issue, though. Um, so 842 million people were suffering from chronic hunger between 2011 and 2013, where those stats were found. Um, so it is an, an issue all over the world, not just in the United States. But obviously, it is a national issue. So this is uh, data from the USDA that 14% of households, 17.5 million households, were food insecure, and half of them experienced that very low food, food insecurity that I mentioned in that slide from the USDA around that breakdown. Households with children report a food insecurity at a significantly higher rate, so those, those family members with young children are more vulnerable and more at risk for food insecurity, and it was especially high within households with children headed by single women or single men, black, non-Hispanic households, and Hispanic households. And research has shown that food insecurity and health outcomes are directly correlated. And so that's why we are really talking about this issue today. And this is the, the highest prevalence, which I just mentioned. One in four children are really, um, we're, we're thinking now that this is where the statistics are, where children experiencing food insecurity or hunger, it's one in four. This is just to uh, think about it in New York City. This is where we are, but I know we are talking to people throughout the state. But just to look at this in New York City, the, how much it has risen in terms of receiving food stamps from 2008 to 2014, um, and then city residents who use food pantries or soup kitchens. And then I just want to show you this really quick um, image where this is from Feeding America, and this is showing us hunger in New York State. So Feeding America is a, is a big resource that I'm going to give you some links to at the end. And this you can sh look all over Oneida County, um, all over New York State, and look at the various counties, and it will show you the percentage of people receiving SNAP, the average meal cost, um, so really taking an inside look around food insecurity. And then I just wanted to talk a minute about food deserts. So one of the things that is happening, uh, unfortunately, more and more, and, and this is happening in rural communities as well as urban communities where there's something called food deserts. And so food deserts are those areas where uh, people do not live anywhere near, you know, if they live a mile or more from a grocery store. And so we see this in our communities in New York City. We see this in our communities in upstate New York. and where people don't have access to nutritious food. So there may be a McDonald's on the corner, but there's not a grocery store where people can easily buy affordable fruits and vegetables. 
And this is just someone to talk briefly about measuring food insecurity. So there are a bunch of different scales. This is what um, we we do assess food insecurity through the Census Bureau, and there's something called the Household uh, Food Security Scales that's used in the Census Bureau. And these are the questions that are in that scale. So is there enough food in the house? Worrying about food running out before I get money for more. So these are those questions around the household and then the adult, and then there are questions around the child. What we have found to be really helpful is there's a lot of awesome work being done in Drexel University in Philadelphia. And there, they um, had some caregivers who were attending the pediatric hospital and looked at them and, and a variety of things that they were dealing with. And they started to ask these two questions from that, that screen to assess um, the risk of food insecurity. And so I just put this up here for you to think about maybe if you're not asking about hunger or food insecurity and the, the uh, families and adults and children that you work with, that these are two questions that you, that you could really begin to ask. And so why is this important to us as uh, behavioral health and mental health providers? Why is it important to us? So we talked about it's highest among children living with single parents um, and is often associated with poor health, frequent illnesses, obesity, lower academic performances, and higher levels of social and emotional difficulties. So we're going to go into detail about that now. This is really looking at the impact of health. This is from 2014 Hunger in America where we found that um, 24 percent of households had at least one member in poor health. 66 percent of households that were food insecure had to choose between food and medical care. And then 33 percent had a household with a member with diabetes and 58 percent had a household member with high blood pressure. So there's a real impact on health as well as mental health. So there's a higher consumption of foods rich in fat and sugar uh, in children. There's a decreased consumption of vegetables and fruits in children decreased physical activity, and decreased height in children. There's also adverse non-cognitive development and social skills, as well as a relationship with depression. Optimal physiological, cognitive, and emotional development and function in children and adults requires access to food of adequate quantity and quality at all stages of the lifespan. So this is the real message here, as well as looking at that relationship between health and how we can begin to intervene if you're not already. So I'd like to, I'm gonna ask that in a little bit. I'd like to hear about that. So let's look uh, in more detail around food insecurity and how it influences health, mental health, and development. We're gonna go through the lifespan uh, starting in infancy. So infants, so j children growing up in food insecure um, families are vulnerable to poor health and sense of development from the earliest stages of life, in utero in particular, um, so pregnant women are often uh, suffering with anemia and that transfers to the baby. Pregnant women who experience food insecurity are more likely to experience birth complications than women who are food secure. Inadequate access to food during pregnancy has been shown to increase the risk for low birth weight in babies. So babies are born already born um, at low birth weight and, and possibly anemic. There's also folic acid and iron deficiency during pregnancy, which can result in prematurity and intrauterine growth restriction. And there's an impact on breastfeeding, um, in particular around initiating and that latching on, as well as how long um, care mothers are able to breastfeed. And there's also, it, it also continues in regards to maternal depression. So there's a real link between food insecurity and maternal depression, um, where there are also adverse effects on kids and, and their development, including a reduced ability to provide needed care. And I know, I know you already know the effects of, of caregiver depression, but just as a, as a reminder, where there's impaired mother-child interaction and attachment, so that that attachment may dis be disrupted, as well as pr um, children may be more at risk for child neglect and abuse. And these are some child hunger facts. I just want to give us kind of a more national view of the issue. So 20% or more of the, of the child population in the 30 states in, in D.C. and throughout the um, United States live in food insecure households in 2014, according to the most recent available data. Mississippi and New Mexico had the highest rates of, of children in households without consistent access to food. Um, proper nutrition is vital to growth and development of children, as we know. While almost 94% of client households with school-aged children report participating in the national school program, only 46% report participating in the school breakfast program. And I think what we know about that, the biggest uh, component of that is stress. So 
So often families have so much going on that getting to school in time to really receive that breakfast is difficult. One of the things that's changed in some of the school air systems is that kids receive a breakfast after the bell as opposed to begin the, before the bell rings, and that's um, been very helpful for kids. So back to thinking about children, they're more likely to have their health rated by caregivers as fair or poor versus excellent or good. So the caregivers are understanding uh, that their kids are already vulnerable. And then again, one in six children skip breakfast, leaving them tired and disruptive in class, um, just highlighting the need again. So children, so households whose insecurity, obviously it has these insidious effects. So not only are kids more vulnerable in regards to their health and their growth, but also developmentally around having poor performance in school, and, and in particular math scores. Um, but also they've been, there's been a link between hospitalization, so that they're hospitalized more frequently, they have uh, asthma and other health conditions uh, more often, and as well as um, some other growth issues. So these are uh, they're more likely to have repeated a grade. And the teachers have noted that they're more difficulty to get along with their peers, and they may have also seen a psychologist. So adolescents, if we move into adolescents and thinking about the impact of food insecurity on, on the development through the years, adolescents are more likely to have dysthymia, which is that lower level of depression. They may have a desire to die or have thought about death or even attempted suicide. I wanted to just interject here and let you know that my colleague, I have some colleagues at the Irma Institute in D.C. who have done some work looking at adolescent food insecurity and have found that adolescents are really putting their lives at risk and engaging in high-risk behavior, including potentially selling their bodies or stealing to put enough food on the, fam on the family's table. There's also some uh, impaired daily functioning with adolescents where kids may be more hyperactive, may be absent from school, or may be late for their classes. And then if we look at adults, so they have a, adults have a poorer quality of diet where they have fewer vitamins and minerals, they have fewer fr fruits and vegetables, and they're also, there's a real link between food insecurity and obesity, especially with adults. In children, it's different. It's not so much clear cut around obesity because sometimes the children are underweight, but in adults, there's a real linkage between obesity and food insecurity. There's also a linkage between depression. And then there's, uh, we're talking about employment. So poor mental health is associated with being able to have employment and keeping a job. And then food insecurity and severe hunger are also associated with mental health symptoms that may interfere with keeping a job. So there's this um, dual relationship that, that's occurring. We also know that food insecurity is an issue for seniors. So those of you that work with seniors, um, more than 5 million seniors ages 60 and older face hunger. Seniors face a number of unique medical and mobility challenges. And they, in particular, are really having to make decisions around, do I put food on the table or do I buy my, my medicine and attend to my medical needs? There's also 60% or more are likely to experience depression, a heart attack or asthma, um, and 40% or more are likely to experience uh, congestive heart failure. And our intolerable conclusion, and I'm sure you all agree, is that food insecurity, even at the least severe household levels, is highly prevalent risk, is a highly prevalent risk to growth, health, cognitive and behavioral potential of America's poor and near poor kids. And so with the idea that, you know, food as well as housing is a human right, and so not having enough food to eat really does have its, have its consequences. I just want to chat with you for a minute. Have you witnessed any experience, any of these? In, uh, this impact or experience any of these effects with the people you're working with or have worked with in the past? I'd like to hear from you if you can chat in. Diana and I would like to hear from you about your experiences. Have you, exper have you seen the impact of food insecurity with the people you're working with or that you have worked with in the past? If you can just chat in. And if so, what did it look like? So I see a yes, a yes, a yes. So what did, what did it look like for you? Working on ACT teams, you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I, I work with food insecurity where you oversee a food pantry every day, a pantry, that's wonderful. Core health and mental health issues. 
benefits not lasting long enough. Yeah, we see that time and time again. Diana and I do a lot of our work in food pantries, and we see a lot more people, families, and adults attending the food pantry at the end of the month because there just isn't enough. Great. Some of you are doing some work and, and academic work around this. And then some of you are connected to programs, local programs, around farms and low-income families. Some of you are coordinating food pantries on campuses. Wonderful. Great. You see some people that are disabled and unable to get out and get food. Yes. That is a real unfortunate issue. There's a program here in the city called God's Love We Deliver. Um, where their motto is food is medicine and they um, bring food to people who are homebound. Someone has seen it in schools that you've worked in. Some see it with foster youth who come in to care after having experienced food insecurity. Great, so you're very aware of the impact. Thank you so much. And please chat in any questions you may have. This is just a summary of what I, all, what I just talked about from prenatal age of zero to three childhood and teen years to adult years, just summarizing the impact around food insecurity and our health and mental health. I just want to take a look at the poverty statistics because poverty is a huge contributor, obviously, to food insecurity. In 2015, 14.5 million uh, people were in, living in poverty. But poverty isn't the only contributor. The other contributor um, in the literature tells us unemployment, so people who are struggling, they may not be below the poverty line or at the poverty line for a variety of reasons, but they may be struggling around keeping a job and that this is really uh, impacting the kinds of food available to them. And another issue is around systemic racism. So if we look at those zip codes where there are food deserts, in those areas where there are food deserts, we see that people are often people of color or, and or often people in poverty. And so that's also something that we need to think about as we attend to this issue. And this is also just a little summary slide that Diana and I put together for you. So there's poverty here in the middle. There's food insecurity. So there are these bi-directional relationships. So there's food insecurity, which often leads to stress. And then the stress is where we also see kind of health, mental health issues, right? And stress often leads to weight gain. We know there's a lot of literature around cortisol levels and what have you. And then weight gain leads to obesity, which leads to chronic disease. So it's this unfortunate cycle, and often poverty is, is one of the biggest contributors. We do have a little video we wanted to show. It's not going to show today, but we're going to put it up on our, on our website, as well as this great little document that we put together for you. This is a guide, a food insecurity and mental health guide that we put together where we have some information around food insecurity, around the impact. We have that two item screen for you where you could begin to use that. And other questions that you can ask around, do you struggle with putting enough food on the table? What role do you think this um, struggle plays in your current challenges? Are you connected to any emergency food programs? And what can I do to help support you in this struggle? So these are some questions that you can begin to ask um, to attend to this issue. And then we have some possible interventions or solutions. Um, so again, understanding the needs of that assessment and then ac helping people access those federal programs. SNAP, WIC, summer food program, backpack program, school lunch and breakfast programs, programs that attend to the whole person, which Diana and I are gonna talk about in a little bit, and connecting those in need directly to food. So are you able to set up a food pantry where you are? Can your organization do this? It sounds like some of you are already doing this. That's amazing. And then getting involved in policy change. You know, I say all of this in the context of our new Republican administration and not really knowing what the future holds. So I always advocate for people to get involved in policy change, especially bringing constituents and people that are, are experiencing the need to the tables of those um, in Albany. And then there's a bunch of helpful resources. Feeding America, No Kid Hungry, Food Research and Action Center, they're amazing. They're a policy-focused organization, which you can go to and, and get involved in a variety of ways. The Food Bank Association of New York State, where you can find all the variety of food banks. There are five throughout the state, five main food banks. Um, and you can also find your regional food bank in New York State with that link. Food pantries, there's a bunch of food pantries. There's a foodpantries.org, where you can find food pantries in your area. Hunger Free America is doing some really great work throughout the state and the United States. New York Food Banks and other assistance. Um, so this can help 
you find information around other assistance, um, New York emergency food programs, and then how to start your own, bo own backpack program. I put a link in um, if you are able. So if you serve a lot of children, for example, who are at, the pover at or below the poverty level and who may receive free lunch, you may also be able to set up a, a backpack program in your organization. We also have this um, handout around this bi-directional relationship between hunger and health, which includes a lot of the information that we talked about today. So I'm going to pass it over to Diana now if there aren't any questions, but you can also feel free to chat them in at any point. Um, we're going to talk about interventions and possible solutions. Uh, yes, thank you, Kara. So we're going to transition now to talking about what we can do to help the people we serve with, in particular in regards to food insecurity. So we do want to hear from you. Um, we want to know what you currently do to intervene or attend to this issue of hunger and food insecurity in your organization or in your agency. Is there anything that you have done, whether it's referrals or how you've communicated with people that you work with? So someone's area here, someone lives in an area where they have food programs in schools and summer programs, and you have seen uh, the direct help of those programs, that's great. Referrals, so referring people to get those needs met. You have a, a, you have a small food pantry available, wonderful. You refer, um, you help people find food banks and refer to social service programs. Um, some of you feel like you're not doing enough, that's okay. Maybe this will inspire you to do something different. We'd love to hear about that as well. Oh, you do Thanksgiving baskets. So a lot of you do Thanksgiving baskets at holidays to provide, um, to provide meals for people. Some of you take families grocery shopping. If you take families grocery shopping, one of the things that we've found to be really helpful with families is something called the store tour through Cookie Matter. So we can also put, put that information on the website um, where you can become a certified store tour leader and connect people to grocery stores, um, which is, is really helpful in focusing on grains and uh, proteins and really spreading the budget, the food budget. A lot of you set up referrals for God's Love We Deliver, great meals on wheels, and you've established food pantries. Local tree, oh, you connect to local churches, wonderful. Thank you so much. This is really helpful. This is really inspiring. Did you have anything you found? Yep, that was about it. Thank you. Um, so we've reviewed some of the prevalence of the impact of food insecurity across the lifespan. So we wanted to just list out here some of the things that you can do, and it certainly seems that a lot of you are already doing this, so this will just be sort of a, a brief recap. But um, before we can even really get to that, the first step is certainly to find out if there is difficulty putting food on the table. So Kara had previously mentioned the two-item screener um, and had listed those two questions for you there. It's certainly a quick and easy way to assess if the individuals you work with are at risk for food um, insecurity. And if there is a positive response, we can then discuss uh, some of the uh, federal programs listed here. So um, it does seem that a lot of you have done referrals, whether it's the SNAP or WIC, uh, the Backpack Program, or the programs actually in school, which is great. Um, we also have the knowledge that obviously these federal uh, food and nutrition assistance programs do continue to help increase food security for millions of individuals in the U.S. However, we should also think about other interventions that provide a more holistic approach. And we'll turn to this in a little bit shortly, but some of these um, can be, as previously mentioned by some of you here, setting up food pantries and, as also was mentioned, actually getting involved in policy change. So what else is going on with the people that we work with? Um, when we see individuals or clients, we more often um, know that there is a reason for referral, right? So the primary issue may be medical or behavioral mental health or substance use issues, for example, either some of these, other things, or a combination of these. And we may sometimes only focus on these issues. While they are important, and we should remember that individuals um, may actually be also experiencing other difficulties as well, though. So food insecurity exists in relation to multiple factors, such as those listed here, like societal, contextual, socioeconomic factors. Yet we don't really know too much about these. 
One of the areas where we need more information is focusing particularly on families with children, um, particularly given the prevalence that it affects this uh, population. So here we were actually particularly interested in the relationship between caregiver stress, family functioning, and food. So there is a need to examine whether the difficulties that individuals, and as I previously said, particularly families with young children, are experiencing in addition to food insecurity. So the popular methods of intervening, such as the SNAP program or the WIP program, are very much needed and assist, in, and assist many individuals each day. However, they mainly focus on alleviating material deprivation and or nutritional information. Um, while these are important, we also realize that there may be other challenges at play that we may never know about unless we actually communicate with the very same individuals who are utilizing these emergency food programs, again, such as SNAP or uh, food pantries. So this is exactly what we've done under our Family and Food Matters project. We focus on caregivers of young children. Uh, the full project examines several topics, such as your experience or their experience with SNAP, supportive services, families purchasing, cooking, and eating habits, as well as traditions and patterns within the family, and then lastly, family life and, of course, food insecurity. So our overarching question in Family and Food Matters was, are families who visit food pantries experiencing other challenges in addition to food insecurity? So we specifically recruited from food pantries because this served as an indicator that there was already difficulty putting enough food on the table. We met with caregivers who had at least one child and we provided them with a questionnaire and for some also uh, we conducted an interview. At the end of their participation, we provided everyone with a resource manual as well just to give them information um, in terms of the local uh, programs that were available to them. Our total study consisted of 99 caregivers, mostly mothers, and of these, um, we did interviews with 59. 75% were already receiving SNAP at the time of the study, and 68% met the food insecurity criteria under the USDA. One of the most important findings, and although not surprising, was that many of the families in our study were experiencing a host of other challenges. Families are dealing with food insecurity while simultaneously dealing with issues such as physical health, mental health, housing, financial issues, and these are just to name a few. I suspect you are aware that many of the people you work with are already dealing with these issues, but have you considered or have you asked if food insecurity is also one of the challenges they may be facing? All of the challenges listed here certainly affect our well-being, and they fall under the social determinants of health, which is our focus today. So in terms of some of the additional findings, um, the caregivers had suggestions for other families. Um, most of these consisted of keeping in touch with families, asking families, because there is at times a sense of, of shame um, in admitting that you are food insecure, in admitting that maybe you don't have enough food to put on the table for yourself or for your young child. Um, in terms of service providers, what we heard from our caregivers was that they also wanted the, the service provider to focus on these other issues, that it wasn't solely the medical, it wasn't solely the mental health or the substance use, but to maybe think about more holistic interventions. Um, and in terms of policymakers, um, extensions or revisions of the current existing emergency food program. One of the things that we also took away from our findings was that we wanted to think about how to help families, not only in terms of the food insecurity, but also how to strengthen the family. Because again, the food insecurity and all these other challenges were happening and are happening with the context of the family unit. So Family and Food Matters was developed from the finding that families are dealing with many challenges all at once. Again, current interventions such as SNAP and WIC are desperately needed, but there is more that we can be done to support families. The focus here is to go beyond providing linkages to only obtaining food or providing traditional nutritional education. We've heard from caregivers that they know what foods are healthy and which are not. The issue is access and at, more at times affordability. So as a result, we created a curriculum. The goals were to strengthen families in addressing the stressors and strains, um, strains associated with poverty and food insecurity, promoting overall access to an intake of nutrition-dense foods for families, 
and also uh, looking to reduce potential youth behavioral health challenges and engagement in risk-taking behaviors. So Kara mentioned a little bit that, a little bit of that uh, earlier on. Thank you, Diana. Yeah, so just to let you know, this is some of the work we're doing at the McSilver Institute. Um, we're tr we are assessing whether it's effective or not. Um, so please be in touch if you'd like in more information. Uh, the fam we know that the, this is helping the families, um, but we're, we're, we don't know to what extent yet, so we're going to be finding that out. I just want to point out that somebody was uh, just talking about food waste, which is a big part of, of uh, the access issue as well. That apparently, we, we waste about 40% of the groceries we buy weekly. Um, and somebody's saying that we waste so much usable food from grocery stores and restaurants that could be utilized. I completely agree. And this is back to those policy issues. So in France, I don't know if everybody knows, but in France there's a policy there where leftover food from restaurants are actually, you can't throw them away. You have to, you have to put them in a grocery store uh, for uh, where leftover food, there are these grocery stores where leftover food goes for people to access in an affordable way. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Another approach, and we're talking about some in, um, interventions and solutions, so another approach to this um, is around community food security. So some of you, I think, are doing this. I just wanted to bring it up because we can in our own communities, and, and when I say community, I don't mean just where you live, but where you work, where you go, may go to school. It sounds like a lot of you are connected to um, college or school in some way. but to know that we can make a difference in whatever community we're involved in. It's a, in the community food security um, intervention is really a, a systems approach, and that's why I really like it. It's re recognizing this relationship between farmers, distributors, retailers, residents in a community, researchers, nonprofits. So it's, it's involving everyone as participants in the food system. Rather than responding to food insecurity with isolated interventions, it's involving everyone um, in regards to the food system. It also looks um, at food policy councils bring people together, different representatives from different groups to examine the food system, and then develop recommendations to improve it so that that change is happening internally. Um, and so the community members are identifying with representation from uh, policy level, local government, around how can we attend to this issue in our community. Or you can do, if you're in a, an organization, going to the leaders of your organization. How can we attend to this in our organization? And then m many of, um, of those projects help to build relationships between farmers and consumers. Um, are, there, are, there, are you trying to set up a, a food pantry? Is there a, a local grocery store that may have um, leftover cans that you could put into your food pantry? Are there local gardens or farmers markets that you could connect with? Um, so the, food and the, the community food security movement works to establish these community gardens, farmers markets, um, and then community supported agriculture programs, which are also known as CSAs, as well as urban farms. So just wanted to talk a minute about that because I think that this is another really helpful intervention and approach. And I just wanted to end with the wise words of, of Dr. Martin Luther King, who says, why should there be hunger and privation in any land, in any city, at any table, when man has the resources and the scientific know-how to provide all man, woman, kind with the basic necessities of life? So again, this is from uh, Feeding America, uses this quote a lot. They're a great resource. I highly recommend that you tap into them um, if you're interested in continuing, continuing to look into this work after today. And then we have a bunch of references. And then I want to just hear from you. I do see a few questions coming in. Let's see. Um, do you have any data regarding this issue as it pertains to college students? Oh, I saw a question about that earlier, so I wrote it down. You know, I don't offhand, but I can definitely look into that and um, get back to you about that. If, if we do find anything, we'll put it on our website, OK? or you're, you are more than welcome to email me at cara.dean at nyu.edu. Besides what we are currently doing now in our agencies, what else can we do to decrease this nationwide epidemic regarding food insecurity? That's a great question. Well, I don't know what you are currently doing, but I'm wondering if you could start where you are and think about directly connecting people to food. In regards to this nationwide epidemic, I really think it comes down to policy and, and looking at getting involved locally with your government and also um, really going 
taking trips with those that you work with who may really suffer with hunger and food insecurity and taking them to Albany. It's really going to take a, a um, kind of global presence around this issue um, because I don't think people understand the pervasiveness of it. And it's changing. Many people who are food insecure are also, you know, food, employment is connected to it, but a lot of people are working and still not able to put enough food on the table. Any other questions? We gave a lot of information in a little bit of time, so we're here to, t to answer any questions you may have. Is there anything else that, that you would find helpful for us to attend to in regards to this for you and the work that you do? We'd love to know that as well. If someone has a grant to address the nutritional needs with a focus on women and girls, what would, you, what would you recommend I do to get the most bang for my buck? Oh, that's another great question. I'd love to talk with you offline about this. We have a lot of ideas. We're currently also um, applying for some funding around uh, pregnant women and food insecurity. So I, I, I would love to talk more about that. So could you email me, kara.dean at nyu.edu? I don't know if it's, um, it's to focus on women and girls. I don't know if it's in your particular community because I would recommend you getting an advisory group, do it, maybe doing some focus groups with women and girls to assess what you can do, but also think, um, creating some sort of way that they get involved in the intervention I think is always most helpful. Um, someone just asked about health homes as an additional referral source. So if you can refer uh, anyone you work with to health homes, I'm hoping that they can also help attend to this issue. I don't know if that's what you're asking. There used to be commercials that focused on education. Do you think that that will be necessary again? Do you mean food education? Because that is something I didn't actually talk about. And I have to tell you why, because in our, liter in our experience around research and going to food pantries and talking to people, food education is not necessarily the answer. What we have learned is that people know how to eat. They know what's good for them and what's not good for them. The issue is around access. I would like to learn more about affordability of healthy food and education about nutrition and healthy eating. Wonderful. We are going to put a link onto uh, our website around Cooking Matters store tour. We highly recommend that you can become, we've all here become store tour leaders so that we can take families on store tours. I think that's an amazing start. I would like to learn more. Um, I would like to learn more about affordability. Okay. I, we just talked about that. What legislative changes can be made at the state level to improve food, food security? Great question. I mean, I think, first of all, raising the minimum wage is huge, right? So if we can, um, I think that's underway, and I'm so excited about that. I think that's going to be huge, a huge help to our communities. But also thinking about the prices of fruits and vegetables. That's why connecting to local farms um, and starting gardens, uh, there's um, an organization in the Bronx called the Green Bronx Machine, and they go into schools and they create uh, edible landscape. I think that's a great intervention. And there, there are a lot of ideas. So I, 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 those are really great questions. I work for a nonprofit health home, and my organization does incorporate food pantry. As staff members, we can submit canned goods and other non-perishable items and give them out to our clientele to help those in need. That's wonderful, fantastic. We just, I just helped my school, I have two kids, and I just helped start a food pantry in the school. And there's a box at the front door where anybody can drop off canned goods. And then there's an open door policy. One of the things, Diana mentioned it, but I didn't really get to talk a lot about it, is the stigma around not having enough food at the table. And I think first and foremost, um, we have to really destigmatize this issue. And one of the ways to do it is just to put out literature and talk about it and ask questions around it. And I think that's a really important point to make. So please reach out to me if you have any other questions. Is there some more? What is a research citation on access to healthy food versus knowledge of what to eat being the real cause of food insecurity? It always seems to me that we hear that they just don't know what to eat. Oh, yes. Great question. I will post some of that. That's, that's really important. 
it's some of it's anecdotal, but there is there is literature showing the same thing. Although although food education advocates will probably disagree with me, I have to say that. Um, but I, in my experience, and in, in reading the literature, in regards to this holistic issue of food insecurity connected to the bi bidirectional relationship, people often know what to eat. What should we propose at the city level to improve food security? Our buildings are all located in parts of the city that have limited access to produce, so beyond health bucks, any other ideas? It sounds like you live in New York City or a city in, in New York State. Um, in New York City, there are many programs. There's Grow NYC, uh, there's Hunger Free America, there are a ton of programs that can connect you and others to their their amazing programs. Grow NYC, for example, has um, they have tables set up all throughout the city where they're where they're selling their farmers markets, and they now have a new initiative around youth led farmers markets, so that teenagers are actually running the farmers market, which I I think is amazing. I think health bucks are really helpful, but they're limited and and they're not always everywhere. And then we have somebody asked a question around recommendations for healthier options. I can stock in my pantry on campus. That's a good question. I think um, I think I would ask the people on your campus what they would like as healthy options. That would be my recommendation. Can you ask people uh, what would be what would be healthy? I mean, always fruits and vegetables, right? If you can have some kind of connection to a farm, you know. Also. We talked about food waste from our, our weekly grocery store shopping, but there's also food waste on farms. You know there's a website, an organization in California where they just sell ugly fruits and vegetables at a really cheap price because they typically go into the dumpster. So if you if your food pantry on campus can connect to a local farm, I would highly recommend that. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up. You all have been amazing. I hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Thank you so much for participating. I just want to go over your CEs. So if you would like to get a CE, you would, again, um, you, when, once you register, as I mentioned in the beginning, within a, a day, you're going to go back on to NYU Silver to that online portal, and you're going to go to your registrations at the top of the page, and next to the name of the webinar you attended, which is today, What's Food Got to Do With It, you will see Take Assessment in red. You're going to take that assessment, you're going to complete it, and once you're done, you will be directed on how to download your CE certificate. If you have any questions, you can call this number, or you can email silver.continuingeducation at nyu.edu. If you have any other questions or concerns or um, anything else I can do to help you on this topic, I would love to do so. This is my email, cara.dean at nyu.edu. I would love to talk with you further about it. And this is Diana's email as well. We're going to give you six minutes of your life back. Thank you so much for participating with us today, and I look forward to hearing from you in the future. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.